Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for coming this evening. We have the great good fortune to have Neil Ferguson with us. He is only here for an hour because he has a plane to catch, so we will have to finish right on time. But until that moment, we have lots of opportunities to talk about his wonderful book, Kissinger, 1923 to 1968, The Idealist. I recommend it strongly. You feel free to order it on your iPhone while I'm speaking. I won't be insulted. <laughs> or even better, stop at a bookstore on the way home and support the bookstores in Harvard Square. Uh, a wonderful book, a uh, great read. Do not be dismayed by the length. It is a wonderful story. So congratulations. Thank you, Thank you Mary. Congratulations Thank on finishing you. this book. Uh, Neil Ferguson uh, is, of course, the Lawrence Tisch Professor of History here at Harvard University. He is also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is the author of, I don't even know how many books at this point. I can't remember. A, lar a lot of books that are also all very good. You can order those too. Uh, <laughs> but tonight we are going to talk about Kissinger. I, by the way, I am Mary Cerati. I am the author of not as many books, but I have re recently written one called The Collapse, The Accidental Opening of the Berlin Wall. And it looks at the end of the Cold War. And it was extremely interesting for me to read this book and read so much about the, the beginnings and the heyday of the Cold War, the events that I know uh, from the other side when they are uh, collapsing and wrapping up. So I'm going to ask uh, Neil a few questions. I have a couple general questions and a couple specific questions. Uh, and then I will open the floor up to you as well, so you will have the opportunity to ask questions as well. So, Neil, uh, you talk a lot about Henry Kissinger's mentor, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, you describe him as, how shall we say, not being exactly studious or bookish. Uh, and he, Nelson Rockefeller, was famous for saying, the best way to read a book is to meet the author. So that is what we are doing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the person of the author is, is, I think, particularly interesting in this case because uh, upon reading the book, it, it's hard to miss the fact that are, there are parallels between your life and Henry Kissinger's life. And I am Although. wondering, <laughs> well, as you say, to quote from the preface, uh, the biographer needs a kind of knowledge that cannot always be found in documents knowledge of the inner and largely unwritten life that a man lives in his roles as a son, a brother, a lover, a husband, a father, and a divorcee. And I, I found that an extraordinary statement of, of uh, authorial honesty. And it made me think the fact that there are parallels. You're, you're a Harvard professor writing about a Harvard professor. Um, you've moved to the United States, albeit under very different conditions. Did you find that a help or a hindrance in writing this book? Well, of course, the, the circumstances uh, of Kissinger's move to the United States couldn't have been more different from the circumstances of my move here. Uh, he came here as a refugee, and the refugees are all in the news right now uh, going to Germany, but Kissinger was one of those who came from Germany to escape the Third Reich, and he came here in 1938 with his younger brother and his parents, and, and with nothing really beyond some articles of furniture uh, from their home in, in Furt in South Germany. Uh, and so the, the, the comparison breaks down because uh, he really had to start from scratch. Uh, I, I was in the happy position of coming to the United States, uh, hired by New York University, then coming to Harvard, uh, where I have had uh, 12 wonderful years. Uh, it's been very cushy indeed. By contrast, Kissinger in New York City in late 1938 has to uh, earn money uh, working in a shaving brush factory, uh, studying nights. And when I looked into this, it was startling to realize that he was, he was studying way uptown. They lived in Washington Heights. Uh, he was at the George Washington High School, but the, the, the shaving brush factory was right down at the other end of Manhattan. Uh, and the long days must have been very long indeed. Uh, he's then drafted and finds himself a grunt uh, in a whole series of bloody awful training camps. Uh, and in that sense, I start uh, as an author uh, with a sense of, frankly, of humility, uh, because this was a very, very tough start in life, to say nothing of the early years uh, under Nazi rule. I mean, imagine being a teenager uh, uh, as a, a Jew living in South Germany, right 
next to Nuremberg, one of the most Nazified cities in the Third Reich, uh, increasingly subject to, physical subject to physical harassment, excluded uh, even from your favorite soccer uh, team's games. Uh, I, I guess you have to know those things uh, before you can begin to understand the, the, the Harvard professor who comes along later. So the point of contact is Harvard. I think it was partly being here that inspired me to do the book because I, I was partly trying to teach myself about Harvard. And this, this book has a lot of Harvard in it. I, I went to great lengths to try to understand the Harvard that he arrived in in late 1947 uh, and, and to understand why it was that, uh, for a time, uh, Harvard seemed to be the principal source uh, of, um, of appointments to administrations. Uh, John F. Kennedy more or less empties the, uh, the faculty uh, in staffing his administration, and, and actually the young Professor Kissinger is one of the people who gets hired in 1960 uh, to go to Camelot. Uh, so I was, I was kind of excited to think about writing a, mm -hmm. a, a Harvard history, and maybe that, that was a point of contact. Yes, that was one of the aspects of the book that I enjoyed a great deal, was learning a lot about Harvard and about what you call boss wash. Uh, perhaps you could explain what that is. Boss wash, I, it, I came across as I was researching the book. You're all probably aware of the fact that the entire world is governed uh, by a corridor <laughs> uh, that, that begins here uh, and stretches down uh, through New York City uh, to Washington uh, and, and the White House. And that, that's Boswash. And that term was actually introduced, I think, was it by Herman Kahn? I'm forgetting now. Uh, to, to, to try to convey what he thought would be the kind of super city uh, of the late 20th century, one single massive metropolis. Uh, and it's still the case that power in the world is to a remarkable extent concentrated in this, in this corridor. And in, I think, in a sense, Henry Kissinger became a, the quintessential denizen of Boswash, uh, as much at home in Harvard Yard uh, as he was uh, in uh, the corridors of power, but also at home in that uh, meeting point of the two, New York City. And yet, despite the fact that so many academics, not only from the government department, but also the history department, have gone down the corridor of Boswash, one of the other findings in the book that really struck me, resonated with me, was your finding of a history deficit in US foreign policy making. Kissinger is, of course, a great exception, having a deep historical knowledge of Europe, the transatlantic relationship, America. But your book repeatedly makes the point that policymakers could use a stiff dose of applied history. And I was wondering if you could perhaps expand upon that theme. Well, this gives me an opportunity to acknowledge Graham Allison, uh, who's here tonight. He and I have been talking about applied history as a, as a project for some years now. And in some ways, this book is a, an example of, of what we have in mind. Uh, it seems to me that history has suffered uh, by comparison with the social sciences uh, pretty much throughout uh, Henry Kissinger's life, uh, even when he was a, a graduate student. Uh, at this university, it was regarded as deeply eccentric that he did his dissertation on, on Metternich Castlereagh and the Congress of Vienna. Uh, uh, there are some MIT people tonight. Uh, when his uh, then mentor, William Yandel Elliott, tried to float him as a candidate for a job at MIT, asking Charles Kindleberger, would they like to hire somebody who knew a lot about the Congress of Vienna? Uh, Kindleberger's retort was, hell no. And the, <laughs> The, the notion that you could learn anything about the uh, brave new world of nuclear weapons and, and uh, Cold War strategy from the 19th century just seemed idiosyncratic at best. I think what I've learned from writing this book, and remember, I'm, I'm only halfway through. This is half time uh, in, in soccer terms. Is that Kissinger's edge was partly the intellectual edge he got from being uh, an historian. Now, we don't think of him as an historian. He wasn't in the history department. He was in the government department. But the key early work is unquestionably history. And one of the, the enduring insights, which you will find in his most recent book, uh, World Order, is that uh, we need to know history. There's a good line which I like a lot. Uh, history is to nations or to states 
what character is to people, to individuals. If you don't know the history, you will not really understand your counterparty. Uh, imagine trying to negotiate with a Russian president, say, not knowing much Russian history. You would be at a huge disadvantage. So one of the first principles, I think, of the Kissingerian approach to international relations is that it's applied history. And what you do when you're confronted with a particular problem or you're negotiating with a particular country is, first of all, get the history. Uh, even if you're frantically boning up on the way to China in 1971 uh, for one of the most important diplomatic meetings of your entire career, uh, you, you're trying to get a handle on, on, on Chinese history before you meet Zhou Enlai. That's actually a great transition to what I wanted to ask you next. Uh, you mentioned, imagine trying to negotiate with a Russian leader without knowing Russian history. One of the uh, surprises of the book for me, although I, on hi in hindsight I shouldn't have been surprised, was the discussion again and again of the Soviet Union as a revolutionary power in the early 1950s. As someone who knows the Cold War from the end, where the Soviet Union seems mired in economic issues, seems everything but revolutionary, it was bracing to be reminded that it seemed revolutionary. And I believe you've brought, brought a video clip along of the young Kissinger being interviewed in 1958, where he talks about the Soviet Union's revolutionary power. Could we potentially play that brief video clip? This is from an interview with Mike Wallace in July 1958. This is one of Henry Kissinger's earliest appearances not on his, television. Not his first but one of the early ones. One of his early ones. And so we have a little bit of a clip. I'm hoping, I'm stalling and hoping. Let me come back <laughs> again to the study called Foreign Policy in the Free Society. In it, philosopher Scott Buchanan says, our problem here in the United States is to exist as a capitalist society in, possibly, a completely socialist, revolutionary world. Now, it would seem, to a certain extent anyway, that that's the way the world is going, is it possible that we cannot exist in such a world? Well, you know, you could argue that the identification of socialist and revolutionary is not a very good identification. You could well argue that uh, a capitalist society, or what is more interesting to me, a free society, is a more revolutionary uh, phenomenon than, so than 19th century socialism. And this illustrates precisely one of our problems. I think we should go on the spiritual offensive in the world. We should identify ourselves with the revolution. We should say that freedom, if it is liberated, can achieve many of these things. Well, what is keeping us from going on the spiritual offensive, as you see? It? Uh, because we've suddenly been projected into a situation for which very little in our history has prepared us and because I'm afraid many of the leadership groups that are engaged in foreign policy uh, have had a set of experience which make experiences which make it rather difficult for them to come to grips with a really revolutionary situation. So could you perhaps give us a little bit of context for that clip and explain the reasons you selected it? Well, a lot of people have asked if I, I subtitled this volume, The Idealist, just to upset readers of the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> and and the, that did cross my mind that it might. But, but that wasn't the reason. The, the, the key point about this, this book is that it, it is certainly not the Henry Kissinger you've been led to expect uh, by Christopher Hitchens or, or Seymour Hirsch or any of the other writers who have uh, portrayed the Kissinger of the uh, Nixon Ford years as the arch realist. And indeed, that, that was the Kissinger I expected to encounter uh, when I took this project on. I, I had a subtitle in my head for volume one, American Machiavelli. Mm -hmm. And then I realized very quickly as I was mm -hmm. working through uh, his writings, published and unpublished, that this didn't work at all and that, uh, if anything, he, he was the opposite. Uh, in the first half of his life, uh, he is an idealist in, in at least three respects. And you, you heard in that quotation there a remarkable thing, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I would hope startled you. Uh, Henry Kissinger arguing that the United States should go on the spiritual offensive on the side of revolution. Now, what's he talking about in the context of 1958? He's talking about the contest that was clearly underway uh, in what came to be thought of as the third world between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, and you know, Wallace asks him, are we going to end up in a, 
socialist revolutionary world, uh, kind of typical post-Sputnik pessimism, uh, very much the missile gap phase of the Cold War when Americans suddenly think, wait a second, we're not completely dominant. In fact, they may be overtaking us. Good God, the, the world's going Khrushchev's way. That, that's the moment. And Kissinger responds by saying, no, why are you equating uh, socialist and revolutionary? Uh, socialism is a 19th century idea. Uh, it's the idea of freedom, the American idea, that's authentically revolutionary, and we're, we're failing to make that case. That was very much of a piece with most of his writing uh, in uh, the 1950s, and the theme continues into the 1960s. So I realized as I was reading through the, the private papers, which is where I began my research, that I had something very surprising on my hands. Henry Kissinger, the idealist, uh, the, the, the Kissinger who studies Kant uh, as an undergraduate, writes the longest senior thesis in this university's history with the modest title, The Meaning of History. Um, <laughs> rather narrowly focused, don't you think? Uh, the Kissinger who, who had, um, I suppose, come of age at a time when materialist philosophy was in the ascendant, whether Marxism-Leninism or its kind of capitalist uh, counterparty. And Kissinger said consistently, from the senior thesis onwards, the Cold War is about ideals. It is not about rival economic systems. If we make it about economic systems, we may fail. Uh, he even writes in the senior thesis that we should reject totalitarianism even if, it, even if it is the more economically efficient system because individual freedom is a higher thing. This is not at all the Henry Kissinger you've been led to expect. Uh, so the point of that clip is just that it illustrates quite nicely where he was coming from at that time. You asked a, a question about the Soviet Union as a revolutionary power. Uh, sure, by the late Cold War, the period that you so brilliantly write about in, in the Collapse uh, book, uh, it doesn't look remotely like a revolutionary power. It's like uh, a status quo power clinging onto the status quo by its fingernails. Anybody studying the Cold War from its inception, as I've done in this book, gets a completely different image yeah. uh, of the Soviet, Soviet Union as the sponsor of world revolution, opportunistically trying to piggyback on decolonization as a movement, uh, often very cynically, but in certainly intent on advancing uh, the, uh, the Soviet version of socialism <coughs> wherever the opportunity arose. And that's certainly the Soviet Union that, that Kissinger saw himself uh, in opposition to throughout the 50s and 60s, and indeed into the 70s. Yeah, I found that one of the most interesting themes of the book, that Kissinger saw himself as an advisor, and then I think presumably in your second volume as, a, as a someone in office, as faced with the challenge of how to move beyond a revolutionary period and establish some kind of new stability. It might not be ideal, but it would be a new stability. And that's a process that interests me very much because, of course, I see at the end of the Cold War all this unexpected upheaval in 1989, and then a different presidential administration trying to move from that ordering moment into a period of stability. I'm wondering, this is a leap forward to the present, I'm wondering if you consider a, the Russian president today to be revolutionary. I'm wondering if there are lessons here for dealing with Putin and his provocations. It, it is quite remarkable uh, what he has been doing. In, in the West, we're, we're out of practice in um, dealing with problems by escalating crises. He seems to be quite happy to do that as a way of addressing what he seems to be problems. Is that revolutionary? Are there lessons here for, for Putin, for current issue relations with Russia? Yet. <laughs> if I were Putin here, I would turn to you and say, no, it is the, uh, it is the United States that is the revolutionary power. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you heard Putin speaking at the uh, UN General Assembly, uh, what he effectively said was that the United States has been the revolutionary power that has disrupted the state order uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, and in arguing for the overthrow of Assad is continuing to make a revolutionary argument, and the Soviet Union is, uh, is uh, on the side of legitimate states. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think Putin has quite nicely turned the tables uh, on the United States for essentially being in two different versions, Bush and Obama, a proponent of revolution in, in the Middle East. Uh, not, not, not to get too deeply into this, because it, it's, it's uh, a long way removed from the 1923 to 1968 time frame. Uh, but I, I think if one looks at what Kissinger has written on this subject, 
uh, in recent years. He has been a good deal more, uh, I hesitate to use the word, understanding or sympathetic towards Putin, but certainly more open to some of Russia's arguments in recent years, for example, on Ukraine, uh, for example, on NATO enlargement. Uh, and I think the reason that, that Kissinger is more receptive to those Russian arguments is that uh, they have some substance to them. Uh, that the critique of the United States as having overreached since the end of the Cold War and having pursued revolutionary objectives is not wholly without some substance. Mm. So you do see some parallels. Well, if we return to the 1923 to 68 time period, I would like to push you a little bit on some of your discussion of Vietnam. And I realize this is work in progress, that much of your discussion of Vietnam will be in volume two. Uh, but um, you do make a few points. Uh, you, you suggest that the, it, as tragic as Vietnam was, we don't know what would have happened if the U.S. had not taken the actions it did. You make the point that um, history is about what happened. If something didn't happen, history doesn't get written of it. You talk about uh, that we don't really know what would have happened had the U.S. not taken the actions that it did. And on page 23, you say it was always better for ordinary people and their children if the United States won. The uh, Kennedy School has just had the wisdom to hire not one, but two of my friends and favorite historians, Fred Lugavall and Arnie Westad. And I'd like to just juxtapose what you've said with what they've said. Uh, so you've said it's always better if the United States wins. Arnie, in his wonderful book, Global Cold War, argues that it's better if superpowers don't intervene. He concludes the book by saying, if there is one big lesson of the Cold War, it is that unilateral military intervention does not work to anyone's advantage. And in the context of the book, he means it doesn't work to the advantage of the US, the Soviet Union, or the countries intervened upon, while open borders, cultural interaction, and fair economic exchange benefit all. And Fred Lovable, in his wonderful study, Choosing War, The Lost Chance for Peace and the Escalation of War in Vietnam, which is about the Johnson decisions in 1965 to commit ground troops, so in the time frame of this book, uh, Fred argues that, quote, too many folks at the time in too many locales saw the futility of what the U.S. was doing, saw alternatives. And so I'm wondering how you are coming down on the side that it's better for the U.S. to fight and it's better for the U.S. to win and what you make of these interpretations of Arnie Westad and Fred Lovable. Well, I don't think these, these positions are actually uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, if, if the Soviet Union and the United States had agreed in uh, 1949, uh, not to intervene in uh, civil wars in crises of decolonization, and had stuck to that, it would almost certainly have been better uh, for all concerned. Uh, but as the Soviet Union wasn't exactly open to such uh, uh, a, a mutual uh, non-aggression or non-intervention pact, uh, the Third World became uh, the scene of multiple proxy wars. And where the United States uh, rolled over, uh, uh, this did not turn out well uh, for those on the receiving end of Soviet-backed regimes. Uh, where the United States uh, stuck on, hung on, and resisted Soviet expansion, most obviously in South Korea, things uh, turned out tremendously well. I mean, think of the extraordinary prosperity of South Korea and the grinding uh, poverty of North Korea. Uh, there is nothing, uh, it seems to me, entirely uh, written in the stars that doomed uh, South Vietnam to oblivion. Uh, the fall of South Vietnam was hardly good news for its inhabitants, uh, if you reflect on what the, uh, uh, the consequences of the fall of Saigon were. So I don't think this is actually a terribly difficult question to answer. Since we know that the Soviet Union was quite hell-bent on uh, spreading uh, brands of, of varieties of Marxism-Leninism wherever it could, I think it would have been disastrous if the United States had simply... Uh, rolled over and let that happen, uh, we would have seen a much larger Soviet sphere uh, with all that that implied for individual freedom, not to mention uh, economic well-being. Uh, now, uh, I think one of the interesting things is that when the Cold War ends, you get some of the proof of Arna Westad's argument because we enter a period uh, which I call the short peace because I think it's now over. Uh, of about 20 years when conflict in the world dramatically declines. I mean, it's an order of magnitude less in terms of battlefield deaths 
in the 2000s compared with the 1970s. And civil wars happen, but they're not fueled uh, by significant external intervention until what became known as the Arab Spring begins, and we see a new iteration of the problem taking place now. So the, the short piece, I think, bears out the, the Westad hypothesis quite nicely, but the short piece wasn't on offer in the 1950s or the 1960s or the 1970s. Uh, and it wasn't really, I think, a, a viable argument uh, for the United States to say, we don't do intervention and we'll just leave the Soviets uh, to it. Uh, that would have condemned a great many countries uh, to a pretty miserable uh, uh, fate. And for all we know, it would have ensured the continued existence of the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, the Soviet Union didn't just self-destruct, let's not forget. Part of what I'm concerned with in volume two is to understand the role uh, of the policy of detente and the opening to China, which is in some ways a corollary of it, in beginning the process of weakening uh, Soviet power. It's too easy to say, as many people did in the 70s and the 80s, that detente's a wrong turning, Reagan got it right, and being tough ends the Cold War. I think I'll probably be arguing against that in, in volume two. One last word about Vietnam. One of, the, one of the things about a book like this, which it's important to convey to an audience of, well, probably majority non-historians, is that the, 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 the insights that you glean from primary sources uh, can transform your understanding of major historical problems. One of the most exciting documents I came across early on in the research was a diary that Kissinger kept of his first visit to Vietnam in 1965. It's an amazing document, uh, fantastically insightful and also revelatory, because it becomes clear as one reads this that pretty soon after getting there, Kissinger saw there was a major problem in the US effort and a major problem uh, with the South Vietnamese regime. So one of the fascinating discoveries of, of volume one is he knew that this thing could not be won and would have to be resolved diplomatically in, in 1965, uh, and indeed had already been distancing himself from the project when Kennedy had been president at the time of the coup against Diem. So if one thinks of Kissinger in the way that, say, Hitchens wanted to represent him, as somebody who enjoyed the Vietnam War so much he didn't want it to stop, then this is a pretty <laughs> problematic uh, piece of evidence. By the way, I've said in the past that one of my reasons for hesitating to write the book was the thought of Christopher Hitchens's review uh, <laughs> I, I'm actually sorry he's not around to, to write the review. I uh, got to know Hitch over the time of, uh, of researching the book, and I've come to the conclusion that if, if he were still around, he'd write a positive review of the book just to annoy his left-wing friends and in, the way he, in the way he did over Iraq. So I guess one of the challenges for the next volume, then, as you describe so beautifully in the book on the basis of sources, and as someone who also works very closely to sources, I have to say the research in this book is jaw-dropping. It is truly impressive how, with the help of research assistants, you were able to draw on sources from over 100 archives and produce an empirical account. And yet, you will have to address this question. As you show in this book, by 1965, Kissinger is, is worrying, is seeing the futility of what is happening, and yet he is in office as the United States then continues to fight a war there until 1975. So I, I assume you will be addressing that in volume two, this mismatch between what you detail here, so what he is saying, it, 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 to some extent in private, and yet his actions as a, as a, as a statesman, they don't match. Well, I mean, there, there's a great um, deal to be said for not talking about books you haven't written. Uh, so oh, go ahead. I will, uh, <laughs> I, will, I will keep myself to a few rough hypotheses. As I think about volume two, uh, there, there are a couple of really important things to, to begin the book with. One is that Richard Nixon was president. Henry Kissinger was not. And part of what I try and do in volume one is explain how that came about. Because it's a pretty surprising thing that Richard Nixon hires Kissinger. You mentioned Nelson Rockefeller. Kissinger was a Rockefeller loyalist. He went through three failed bids uh, by Rockefeller for the Republican nomination. Uh, he, in the course of that time, was critical of Nixon and indeed uh, openly uh, contemptuous of him on occasion. Uh, so one of the mysteries of volume one is why did Nixon give 
Kissinger the job? There is a funny answer to this question, which I can't resist telling you, because I learned it from Guido Goldman, uh, and Guido has been a great asset to this university. I don't think the Center for European Studies, where I hang my hat, would exist without Guido. Guido's answer to the question was this, that Henry Kissinger was the only thing of Nelson Rockefeller's that Richard Nixon could afford. <laughs> Just such a great line. That is not the answer to the question, but it is a good line. Actually, another good line, you, you point out correctly that Richard Nixon was indeed president, but your introduction includes some of the most famous one-liners either said by Kissinger or about Kissinger. And one of them was a joke, I think, from the mid-1970s. What would happen if Henry Kissinger died? Richard Nixon would become president. Yeah. And already that, that, that gag reflected the extraordinary transformation that occurred uh, from 69 when I think Nixon assumed that a Harvard professor would be a cipher who would essentially uh, execute presidential foreign policy and help him circumvent the State Department. That was the plan. Uh, by 72, 73, uh, they're being covered in the press as, uh, as equals, uh, if not... Uh, that Kissinger is the dominant player in foreign policy. That was, of course, intensely galling of course. Uh, to Nixon right. and the source of great, of great tension. It, even worse, them. when Kitchener win Kissinger wins the Nobel Peace Prize, he can't figure out how to tell Nixon. Yeah, yeah it's a, <laughs> so it's a kind of fascinating relationship, yeah. uh, which I've only really begun to write about, because there almost was no relationship between Kissinger and Nixon before 1968. They didn't meet until 67. This was a surprise to me. I was absolutely sure that I would be able to find the original meeting, that there would be some prehistory to the relationship. This is, again, you know, how history works. So I spent a lot of time digging, and I thought I'd found it, because it turned out that William Yandel Elliott, who was really Kissinger's Harvard mentor, his, his professor, advisor, patron, had been an advisor to Nixon, had got to know Nixon in the 50s, and had really become a, a kind of peripheral but not completely irrelevant part of the, the Nixon 1960 campaign. So I thought, got it. I'm gonna be able to show that this is the origin of the relationship. And then two things turned up in the archives that blew the theory up. One, Elliot, already suspecting that Kissinger is the sorcerer's apprentice, writes to Nixon saying, there are many people you should consult at Harvard in thinking about national security strategy. Henry Kissinger is not one of them. <laughs> so the knife goes in true academic politics fashion. But uh, Nixon ignores that uh, and writes to Kissinger anyway, saying, I'd like to pick your brains. It's, you know, this is after Rockefeller's clearly not, not going to get the nomination. Kissinger, by this time, was so eager to avoid Nixon that to avoid the meeting, he said, I'm going to Japan. Now, if you want to really <laughs> avoid somebody and they invite you to, to meet or even just to correspond, the, saying you're going to Japan is a kind of extreme uh, <laughs> way of avoiding seeing them. And, and it meant that they, they did not meet until December 1967 mm. uh, at a New York cocktail party. Mm. I wish I had been a fly on the wall <laughs> for that very awkward meeting. Uh, and it was, it was Nixon who broke the ice, very unusually for him because he was socially famously awkward. Uh, but Nixon's able to say to Kissinger, uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger, I, I've read one of your books, which is the way to get on the right side of an academic if you ever are at a cocktail party uh, with one. Uh, so, so that's the beginning of the relationship. And I've come to realize that, in, in a sense, Nixon had been reading Kissinger. We, we know he'd read Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy and much else besides. Uh, and in that sense, the meeting was a, a meeting of minds before it was a meeting of, of bodies, a meeting of, of, of individuals. I am, in a minute, going to turn to all of you and ask you for questions, so please start thinking about them. There are standing mics, if you could please use those uh, for the benefit of people viewing this on live stream. But uh, before I do that, uh, I'll give you a minute to think of your questions, I do want to ask one final question about one of the more hair-raising parts of the book. Uh, the, the shadow of Dr. Strangelove lingered in my mind after some of these passages where Kissinger argues in favor of fighting limited nuclear war with tactical nuclear weapons. These were deeply scary, and I was pleased much later in the book to see Kissinger backing away from that, but 
Uh, it was alarming to see his early commitment to this idea that Mike Wallace interview that we just showed you, if we could show you at a full length, you would see him endorsing limited nuclear war. Uh, you point out that Kissinger was making uh, errors of, uh, of two orders of magnitude when he talked about how explosive these weapons would be. So he was saying, you know, they'll be fine in this limited use when they would not have been fine. I would just be interested to know how, how hair-raising it was for you mm. to research some of this. Well, Dr. Strangelove is a movie that some of you have almost certainly seen, and if you haven't, then you really must, uh, because apart from anything else, Peter Sellers gives the performance of his life, uh, or performances because he's multiple characters. But the character of Strangelove has uh, sometimes erroneously been linked to Kissinger, uh, erroneously because it, 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 we know it wasn't Kissinger who in, inspired it. Uh, it might actually have been Werner von Braun, because C C Strangelove is obviously supposed to be a Nazi, uh, that, that's why he keeps trying to stop his arm from being outstretched and refers to the president as Mein Fuhrer uh, in a few ill-judged moments. So it's not, uh, it's not Kissinger who's there. Uh, and indeed, this whole strange love plot is about the, the doomsday machine, which blows the entire world up uh, automatically in the event of a Soviet or American strike. So uh, strange love is fun, but not relevant here. Kissinger wrote a book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, published in 1957, that made him a star. You know, you ask this, uh, the sort of, you ask yourself, how does somebody who knows about the Congress of Vienna ever get to be a, on TV? And the answer was this book. And he only ended up writing it because he couldn't get tenure at Harvard. He didn't want to go to the University of Chicago, understandably. Actually, it's not understandable. I can't quite work out why he was so determined not to go to the University of Chicago, except maybe it was not Boswash. Uh, and he ends up at the Council on Foreign Relations, which is in Boswash uh, in New York, as essentially rapporteur on the Council on Foreign Relations study on nuclear strategy. And he sort of takes over the project, uh, which isn't too hard to do because the experts around the table all disagree and have completely contradictory views. Kissinger turns it into a book that makes an argument that, as you say, sounds a bit scary when you first hear it. More than a bit. <laughs> well, then think about what it means. Because Kissinger's argument is we can't have a choice between doing nothing or blowing the world up, which is essentially what Eisenhower had set up with mm. the notion of massive retaliation. And Kissinger's point was if that's yeah. our strategy, yeah. then we'll never really be able to resist Soviet encroachments in places that the American public don't think the world is worth blowing up over. So the argument of the book is not that one should use nuclear weapons, but that one should have the option and one should seek credibly to threaten to use nuclear weapons in a limited way that is not designed to blow the world up. This addressed a fundamental problem that NATO had to grapple with for most of the Cold War, massive asymmetry in conventional forces in Europe. Now, What's interesting about the book, it seems to me, is it's part of an effort by Kissinger to normalize the Cold War historically uh, and to remove it from the realm of it's Armageddon or nothing. And in some measure, the book was successful for just that reason, uh, that it created a more rational sounding way of dealing with uh, Soviet aggression, Soviet threats. A few years later, he did something that academics aren't allowed to do anymore, which was to change his mind. Uh, and say, you know, on reflection, the risk of escalation just can't be dismissed. But when you think about it, the principle of limited nuclear war lived on after he repudiated it mm. and became central to NATO's strategy uh, for the rest of the Cold War. Otherwise, what were all those battlefield uh, short-range nuclear forces for? So the book is an important one. I think it made an important contribution to, to strategy during the Cold War. And, and it makes sense that it was that book that made him, him, him famous. Yep. That interview, as you rightly say, is mostly about that issue. They only get onto revolution in the third world towards the end. Right, no, that actually is one of the more interesting themes of the book. He, Henry Kissinger, as you portray him, clearly says, you know, it's when you're a statesman, the choice isn't between right and wrong. No, no sentient person is going to consciously choose wrong. Uh, the choice is among a lot of bad alternatives. That's the real challenge. And, and this will be my final comment, I promise I will let you talk. Uh, you, a, a couple of times, talk about the book as a, a Bildungsroman, a German phrase meaning a, a story of how a young man is educated. And you, at one point, explicitly refer to Goethe's wonderful work, um, Wilhelm Meister's Lehrjahr, the, the, the apprenticeship of, of, of Master Wilhelm. And I actually, 
what it is certainly a Bildungsroman, but it is also uh, something else that I know from Goethe, which is a Briefroman, a, a letter, a book of letters. And I'm thinking of Die Leiden des Jungen Werthers, The Sorrows of Young Werther. And the reason I bring this up is that there is a wonderful line from Werther where, uh, I'll say it in German and then translate it. In German, um, Werther says, in der Welt ist es sehr selten mit dem Entweder oder getan. In this world, it's very rare that you do either or and then you're done. You, you have to deal with a broad spectrum of issues. You can't just say either right or wrong and then we're done. And in many ways, I saw this as a, the sorrows of young Henry mm. dealing with all these issues and might perhaps encourage you to take uh, Werther on in your volume two when you look for parallels. So Great idea. Thank I have you. gone on much too long. I know you have tons this of questions. This is what you come to Harvard for. <laughs> Quotations from Goethe in the original. <laughs> uh, I have been gone on much too long. Please, if you ask a question, please uh, state your name, identify yourself. Uh, please keep it brief because I know we have many questions and I know that Professor Ferguson has to leave. And uh, please have a question mark at the end. And Professor Westad has indicated that he would like to chime in. Could you, could you perhaps use the, a microphone? They're not roving mics, Arne. You'll have to, you'll have to, rove. You'll have to rove to the mic. As these Just fine people have done so over here. By the way, we should take this opportunity to welcome our Arne Westad to we Harvard. This is one of the great coups of the year. Luring Anna away from the London School of Economics. Uh, oh, it'll just go to his head. Don't, don't, don't uh, even start. I was just giving him time to get to the microphone. <laughs> that's, that's very kind and very generous. And I, in, in return, I can congratulate you on a biography fantastically well done. I'm, I'm deeply, profoundly impressed, as you know, much more than I expected to be uh, of the book. I have a question that really links to what Mary broke, uh, brought up earlier on about the transformation of Henry Kissinger during the 1960s, basically his Rockefeller era, as it were. And in reading the book, I was wondering whether you would agree with a presentation of Kissinger, to some degree at least, in his American setting as a political naive. I mean, someone who doesn't really understand, at least in a fundamental sense, the American political system that he is trying to operate within. Now, you say in the book, and I think you write about that, that this, of course, changes during the run of that decade. So when he comes to work in the White House for Richard Nixon, he's much better prepared than what he would have been, say, a, a decade earlier. But would you agree with that? I mean, in, in, in terms of Kissinger's approach, that there were a lot of issues that are intimately connected to the American political process that he really didn't understand. Yes, I think that's right, and I think the book gives some wonderful examples of this, Anna. I mean, he, he can't believe his eyes when he goes to the 1964 Republican National Convention in San Francisco. That's the one where uh, Barry Goldwater gets the nomination and Rockefeller's howled down by Goldwater's supporters. Uh, Kissinger's totally shocked because it's his first real encounter with, re with real American conservatives. Uh, I mean, he'd thought of himself as a conservative, but definitely in a European sense of the word, uh, uh, he was so alarmed by the Goldwaterites, who made it very clear that they did not like him, that he draws comparisons between the atmosphere at the convention and, uh, and, and fascism. Uh, so he, I think, was uh, always at a disadvantage as someone who had arrived uh, as a refugee and had not been to a very large number of states. That's one of the things I try to work out. You know, you're, you're kind of getting into just beyond single digits on the lecture circuit, but you really don't have the kind of intimate knowledge of the US system that you have if you're a native born. And I think it's a handicap, even in 1968. Mm. William F. Buckley, who, who was a friend, but a, always a critical friend, teases him about his naivety on the question of the 1968 convention. I mean, Kissinger's the last person in the entire world who thinks that Rockefeller uh, is still in contention at that point. Uh, but I think one of the striking things about this naivety, which you mention, is that it, it helps us see Kissinger in a new light. Uh, the, the standard Kissinger is conniving, duplicitous, getting to the top of the greasy pole by fair means or foul. That's totally inconsistent with somebody who sticks with Nelson Rockefeller through three <laughs> doomed bids for the <laughs> nomination, at least after two uh, a more ambitious and ruthless person would have, would have ditched him. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite 
impressed by the ingenuous quality of, of Kissinger's view. And I don't think it wholly goes away, because even in office as Secretary of State, he's trying on his lecture tour to sell détente to the American people. Practically goes to every state. Totally doesn't work. Um, he just he can't he can't sell that essentially foreign message. It's even a foreign word. God damn it, uh, to a skeptical public. Sir. Thank you. My name is Zoltan Feyer. I'm a diplomat from Hungary. Currently a mid-career graduate student here in at the uh, Kennedy School. Professor Ferguson, welcome. Congratulations on the book. I just started reading it. It's fascinating. And I would continue the line of thought in my question on that on your conversation I brought up um, and also Professor Westad's um, question has brought up, which is the evolution of Dr. Kissinger's political views, ideology. I, I come from a country which was liberated by the... Uh, the year of miracles in 1989, uh, I think in large part by uh, the politics of the, uh, the foreign policy of the United States, um, in some ways by um, Dr. Kissinger's work. And I would characterize Dr. Kissinger as, as anti-communist, but he's also known for his deeply rooted realism, which Professor Ferguson, you alluded to when you mentioned how Kissinger has been "Quote unquote soft on Putin, um, you know about no NATO enlargement. His his recent idea about Finlandization. How would you characterize his the evolution of his ideas, his views on communism uh, from the early years? Thank you. Great question, Zoltan. Thank you. At some level, uh, because he wasn't immersed in in Russian history the way he he was in in." Uh, Central and West European history, Kissinger took his views on the on Russia, stroke the Soviet Union, uh, from others. Uh, th there's a, a strong element of Kennan in some of what he writes about the Soviet Union, in uh, even in the 1950s work. I think um, at the moment the Soviet tanks uh, roll into uh, Budapest in in 56. He's uh, uh, he's as in, in, in incensed as uh, nine years ago today. Right. Uh, Good point. Uh, a date to a date to remember, and a, and a shaming date. A date that reminds us of mm. the importance of my earlier point that it was generally not good when the Soviets rolled in to a country unopposed. Uh, I think his reaction to that was very like Fritz Kramer's. Kramer, we haven't mentioned yet, but Kramer was really Kissinger's ur mentor. The uh, Mephistopheles, I suggest, to his Faust. Sorry for all these German literature references, uh, but it's kind of fitting. Uh, and they were both incandescent about what had happened. And one of the most sort of moving letters in the book uh, is about, uh, about this disastrous event. What changes? I think what changes is the realization uh, that the Soviet Union can or is ceasing to, become, to be a revolutionary power. It can gradually become part of a legitimate international order, and you need it to be. The pivotal moment is not so much accepting the job from Richard Nixon, though that is clearly a key moment. It's earlier than that. The question Kissinger asks himself is, how on earth do we get out of this mess that Lyndon Johnson has landed us in? It's a total mess in 1969. They're in this catastrophe of a war in Vietnam. But they're also at a disadvantage in all kinds of other respects, too. The answer to that question cannot be found in Kissinger's early idealism. It doesn't give you an answer to how do we get out of Vietnam and how do we get out with something intact. And I think it's, it's interestingly, his engagement with Bismarck that is the beginning of the transition to a realist view. Uh, it's the biography that he wrote but never published of Bismarck, which I found in his, in his private papers, fascinating document. And that's where he grapples with the problem. He does not like Bismarck's utterly amoral approach to power. That's very clear from the bit he published, the article on the white revolutionary. But he does admire Bismarck as a strategist. And he's impressed at the way Bismarck understands how to work the balance of power. And I think it's there that Kissinger begins to think about working the balance of power to America's advantage. Uh, and the opening to China is really the key the key move uh, in, trying to, in trying to force the Soviet Union in 
from, as it were, being a revolutionary part of being part of a system that you can play to your own advantage? Long answer, but great question. We now have, unfortunately, just under 10 minutes, uh, and then it will be time for you to dash for your plane. What I would like to propose is that we have the shortest possible version of the questions from the people who are standing up. Perhaps we'll just get them all together, and then you Good can idea. decide on the final point. So if I could ask the people who are standing up just to really, in one sentence or two, uh, summarize your questions, and then we'll let Professor Ferguson choose which to address for his final remarks. Simone. Hi, uh, my name is Simone. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, my question is just a quick two-part. Um, one, what do you think Kissinger's comments on the Iran nuclear deal would be? And then two, given the talks that have been happening in the Middle East, given like Putin's machinations, do you think the Cold War is really over? <laughs> Sir. Uh, Tom Simons. Uh, I'm at the Davis Center. I was a US diplomat. I served under Kissinger and admired him. My question is whether you're getting evidence that even before he came to office, he was a declinist before the letter, that he <laughs> felt that the Soviet Union was on a historical uh, upward curve uh, toward ascendancy and the US was on a downhill curve, and that the only way that you could stabilize that situation was to fix it where the two points on the graph crossed by diplomacy. Thanks, Tom. Sir. Hi, I'm Vaibhav and I'm at the Harvard Business School. Uh, just a quick question about, you mentioned about doomsday clock uh, in the Cold War era, and today we have multiple doomsday clock in Southeast Asia, Middle East, et cetera. In a world where the short peace has ended, who do you think in 21st century will occupy the mantle Kissinger occupied in the last uh, couple of decades? Thank and you. the final two questions over here. Uh, my name is Kamil Altintasholu. I'm an undergraduate student at Babson College. And I was wondering why you have chosen to write the first volume, like to dedicate an entire volume to the period before Kissinger ever held office, and when the next volume is coming out. <laughs> <laughs> and the final question. Uh, David White at the Belfer Center. I was curious to uh, your take on Jeremy Surrey's argument that uh, Kissinger's experience as a Jew in Germany uh, really created a sense in him of being an internationalist, uh, a person of the world rather than a parochial or even just nationally minded individual. So you have about five minutes to handle all of that. That shouldn't be a problem, right? We know um, Simone uh, Kissinger's views on the Iran nuclear deal because he published an op-ed with uh, George Shultz, highly critical of the deal before it was done, uh, and then uh, fell silent, but I don't think has significantly modified his view. I interviewed him about this uh, at Yale earlier this year before the deal was done and pressed him uh, to, to tell me what the alternative was. And it was one of those moments when the alternative matters as much as what was done, and, and I felt that there wasn't actually a, a particularly strong answer to that question. Same is true in his account of the deal in, in his book, World Order. Uh, is the Cold War over? Very definitely. I don't think we're seeing uh, a new Cold War here. We are seeing uh, a very weak Russia uh, being led with a tactically, by a very tactically skilled chess player. But being led, it seems to me, from problem to problem, not from victory to victory. Uh, Tom, I think the view of, of uh, Kissinger as a declinist is, is not quite right. There were obviously many people, uh, not least um, uh, our colleague Richard Pipes, who, who, who felt that the Soviet Union was doing much better than it really was, and that if anything, the CIA was underestimating its strength. And there certainly, in that sense, was a narrative about, uh, about Soviet strength that with the benefit of hindsight, and what we now know seems uh, uh, overblown and overdrawn. For me, I think uh, Kissinger was not, so, uh, was not so pessimistic. I think his indifference to economics was in some measure a, an advantage in this discussion. Uh, because if you, sorry Tom, I lost you. Um, because in, in, in many ways, if you just ignored economics and looked at firepower, and then the Soviets were in the ascendant uh, right through the 60s and the 70s, and ended up with this ridiculously large uh, stockpile, which was something that it was right to worry about. Uh, and after all, think of 1983. Uh, even with their economy obviously stagnating, they still had the capacity to blow the world up if they misread US, US intentions, which they nearly did under 
under Reagan. So I think the key thing here is to realize that Kissinger tended not to think about this in economic terms. Uh, and, and, and that may in some ways have been an advantage when so much that we thought about in the Soviet economy turned out to be completely wrong. Um, who uh, will take his place um, was the, uh, the HBS uh, student's question. Maybe there just um, isn't a possibility now for, uh, for a Harvard professor to be catapulted into such a position of power. Um, I had a long and interesting discussion about this subject with a Harvard professor who has been more recently catapulted into a position of power, Larry Summers, uh, our, our former uh, president, a man I owe a great deal because it was he who hired me and invited me, encouraged me to come here. Larry's point was that the system has become so much more bureaucratic and so dominated by professional politicians that it's getting much, much harder for somebody from the outside for an academic to come in and play that kind of a part. And that may explain why we don't really have a strategy anymore uh, in the United States, because you know, nobody capable of thinking strategically is allowed anywhere near uh, the process, uh, at least so far as I can see. Um, but how do you really feel? <laughs> you know, it's a slightly sad reflection, isn't it, that, that uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter comes out of uh, her time as... Uh, director of policy planning and, and writes a book about how difficult it is to be a working mother. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was quite difficult to be a working father, but that's not really the, the thing that Kissinger wrote about. Uh, and I, I do wonder a little bit about what happened to our strategic thinking policy elite. I'll take the last question very quickly. Jeremy Suri was right to think that Henry Kissinger's Jewish origins matter but I think he got the answer wrong, and he can't be blamed for that because he didn't have access to the private papers. The key point, as I show in the book, is that Kissinger, who came from a devoutly orthodox background, lost his religious faith at some point in World War II, uh, continued to identify himself at, uh, and, and think of himself as a Jew, but was not an observant and believing one. And his values, uh, it seems to me, owe much more, at least in, 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 in conscious terms, to the Enlightenment uh, than to, uh, to the Jewish uh, tradition. Uh, I say all this with, you know, with a certain caution. It's extremely hard to write at the biography of such a complex figure, uh, multifaceted, uh, as Hans Morgenthau said of him. Uh, this is the hardest book I've written, and I thought the history of the Rothschild Bank was, was pretty hard, but this is harder and I'm only, uh, I'm only halfway through. Uh, we haven't really had a chance to talk about its genesis and how I came to, to write it. Uh, I discuss all that in the, in the preface, explaining how I came to, to, to write it at his suggestion, but insisted that if I were to do it, I had to have a completely free hand. Uh, in that sense, this is not an unauthorized biography in the sense that the subject signed off on it. Uh, it's, it's an authorized biography in the sense that I'm the author. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Neil. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Good. Good luck with your flight.